You're listening to the Geekscape Network. Time to fire up the VCR. This one's my favorite. Welcome to Analog Jones in the Temple of Film. I'm Steve. And I'm Matt. And we're a VHS podcast that looks at the trailers, box art, and behind the scenes. And this week, we start Matt's March. Yes, we are doing a noir month, so we are in Noarch uh, here. And we're going to kick it off with the Neo Noir from 1999, 8mm. This is the mortgage, Cindy's college money. Mm. If I do right by Mrs. Christian, the circle she runs in, this could be the break we've been waiting for. Can't take more than a couple weeks. That's all I can tell you, honey. Sometimes you can't know what I'm doing. It's better that way. It's always that way. You come highly recommend it, Mr. Wells. You're praised for your discretion. Thank you, ma'am. As you know, my husband passed away recently. Yes. My husband was the only one with the combination to this safe. These were my husband's private things. I didn't. I didn't realize. Do you want to tell me what you found, Mrs. Christian? Private Detective Tom Wells is one of the only people who has seen it. It is eight millimeters wide. It runs at 16 frames per second. And he has been hired to discover. All I want is to know. This atrocity is false. I want the proof of it. If what's on it is real. Finding the guys who made this film is going to be very difficult. I need information. I thought you might be able to help. You name the vice, I name the price. I'm going to tell you, there's things that you're going to see that, that you can't unsee. They get in your head and they stay there. Some doors should never be opened. Tom, where are you? I dance with the devil. The devil don't change. The devil changes you. Because once you go through... I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. There is no going back. No! <laughs> Nicholas Cage. I'm trying to understand! Whoever you were, just forget about it. I can't. There's no one left to finish this but me. Eight millimeter. A film by Joel Schumacher. Ew, it's gross. Grody, Grody, 8mm, uh, from the writer of Seven. And I think he was trying to keep on that wave of Seven here. He sure was. And it was <laughs> directed by the man Joel Schumacher. He was coming off a really good movie that made uh, headways with the uh, critics. What was the movie again? Batman and Robin was what uh, Schumacher came off of. Ouch. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know too much about Schumacher personally i've heard some kind of sketchy things about him but uh as a filmmaker uh i really like him as a filmmaker uh because not so much Batman and robin but when i think of like the lost boys or falling down this movie he definitely has a style uh a very uh you know overwhelming style a little bit that i i, I find enjoyable yeah he's done a i mean john schumacher just has a lot of Really crazy films. When you think of, you know, just the La the, the Lost Boys, uh, St. Elmo's Fire. We just have so many. Uh, Falling Down is one I always find really interesting because that was a nasty movie, too. Yeah, I, I love Falling Down. And um, he did The Client, which I really like. He did Flatliners, which I really like. Like, he, he is a director that is fun to watch. And, I mean, I, I love Batman Forever as well because of kind of what it is. Um, Baron and Robin, I can't defend, but, uh, he's, he's just done some good stuff. I, I like Joel Schumacher's films overall. I just love that he goes from the set of 
Batman Forever to eight millimeter. Batman and Robin. I mean, Batman yeah, and Robin. Literally. And next just, next movie one year apart. And after while recording this movie, maybe, or maybe it was during the post, is when he did his public apology for Batman and Robin, correct? Yeah, I mean, on the director's commentary for the the Batman and Robin is where he like just straight up apologizes for the movie. Right. But yeah, but he did a public one too on video, right? Oh, did he? Okay, I'm thinking of the commentary, which might be on like laser disc or whatever would have come out in '97, early DVD. If there's anybody watching this that, let's say, loved Batman Forever and went into Batman and Robin with great anticipation, if I if I disappointed them in any way, then I really want to apologize because it wasn't my intention. My intention was just to entertain them. Um, but yeah, he probably also did a public one. Uh, yeah, no. but this is this is sort of proving he's still got an edge, I guess, and that's what this is, and that's probably why he did pick up this script from the writer of Seven and mm-hmm. one of my favorite movies, Brain Scan. Uh, <laughs> well, he had quite a uh, quite a run going on when it came to writing these movies. Uh, he did obviously Seven, which we mentioned, Eight Millimeter, Sleepy Hollow, which I did not know he wrote that. Yeah, I like Sleepy Hollow a lot, too. I think it's a really cool movie. And it looks like he was a script doctor on Fight Club and Stir of Echoes. Yeah, and I remember and a script doctor on Panic Room. Hmm. You like to stick around with uh, uh, Fincher. I do remember that he was uh, he wrote The Wolfman in 2010. Yeah. Because I believe in the trailers they used to say from the writer of Sleepy Hollow and Seven. I believe that. Um, I think I and I like the 2010 Wolfman because I I think it's the only one that sort of has gotten right that like vibe of uh, the 40s movie and I think that's because they had Joe Johnson who obviously gets mm-hmm. how to do the 40s movie thing um, but uh, uh, yeah I, I I like that movie it's it's slow it can be a little boring but I like how I... much it gets the universal horror vibe i remember not liking it so maybe one day i can revisit but i saw it in the theater and was expecting something else which is fine i mean sometimes that works out i just yeah i definitely remember it being slow and since i knew it was directed by joe johnson i thought it would be a different film yeah no and they advertised it more of an action movie and it turned out to be more of like a big sweeping gothic thing Mm -hmm. uh instead but uh, anyway, back to eight millimeter. Jumping, jumping back to eight millimeter here. Uh, let's let's take a look at the box art, shall we? Yeah. Do, well, I mean, uh, I I hadn't seen this. In oh, the history, little yeah, history yeah. portion. I have not seen this probably since the early two thousands. And uh, what I felt after watching it the first time, I basically felt this time. I was like, good. I know this is a good movie, but I don't like it. It's it, too icky for you. It, yeah, well, and it's not so much for the obvious. Of course, the raping in it and the just treating women like trash. Of course, that makes me feel icky. But it, it's more it, it's more of just like, you know, this underground bullshit is real. Yeah. It's scary. It's scary yeah, stuff. <laughs> it just, that makes me feel gross. The, the, you know, fantasy story here where he's solving the crime and, you know, he gets revenge I, I like I like that. It, it's just the real stuff that's it gets real too real in this. Where I'm like, oh, this fucking this fucking legitimately happening right now. Yeah, Yuck. yeah, that's 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 rough. Um, I had never seen this full film, but I have seen chunks of it. I just I think I you know walked in on when my parents were watching it. I probably caught bits and pieces on HBO when this was on HBO a lot. Um, I knew it was kind of a edgier film. I knew oh, it was yeah. definitely more uh uh rougher i guess is the word i'm looking for and i probably only just caught glimpses of it i mean it was like 9 10 when this came out so i was a little young and i i watched everything when i was young i watched whatever but like this one sort of had a certain cachet to it where i was like i might stay away from this one a little bit um and i so i just had never seen it um and then this was the first time i had watched it in its entirety yeah, this is female nudity where it makes you feel incredibly uncomfortable, even as a teenager. Right, yeah, even when, like, 
the fucking wind gives you a boner. Like, you don't want to see this. <laughs> like, no. This is, you, you don't want to see this. Like, you didn't have to hide it with a book yeah, this <laughs> for this is, movie. <laughs> this is gross. This is not, like, fun nudity for teenagers. Uh, and, and it surprises me what they got away with this, especially in 99. Yeah. This one pushes the limits of the, the nudity and, like, the sex, you know, the, the simulated blowjobs and things like that that are happening in this movie like this pushes this pushes buttons and i know this got an unrated version on the dvd uh later and um, i think i had that uh i don't have the dvd case for it anymore i just have the dvd and it it is a fucking cheap ass um transfer it just says eight millimeter on it joel schumacher nicholas cage go Oh, yeah, probably early DVD. Yeah, it was straight play, from 99. It was play movie, trailer, and then, you know, a couple of the choices you have with stereo and all that yeah. shit. So, so there's nothing on it. Um, we've It's funny, we've talked about in the last two episodes, like, with Death Wish and Over the Top, I was like, yes, Shout Factory are going to pick this one up. Shout Factory did indeed put out 8mm, <laughs> I think either this year or the year before. Um, so this just came out on a Scream Factory release uh, from them. Uh, I don't know how many bonus features are on there, but this tape does have a bonus feature at the end, so we'll come back to that uh, when, we get, mm-hmm. when we get there. I loved it when they did these on tapes. Uh, and then sometimes... Uh, nowadays, you have to stay for after the credits to get like the bonus to get the extra scene to yeah. lead into the sequel. And this one, you know, with these VHSs, like with Scream that came out, Scream did it in eight millimeter. You get little bitty featurettes. Yeah, it's like the the full moon thing when they did the yeah. video oh, zones. Yeah, which was my gateway drug into wanting to make movies. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, these are fucking wonderful. I love these little behind the scenes things. Uh, but it is funny that the DVD didn't have any of that <laughs> no i hope there's a dvd out there well now we know yeah now the scream factory blu-ray is probably stacked i'm assuming because they don't do anything half-assed so i'm sure it's stacked um pretty sure columbia was just like yeah have whatever you yeah, want yeah here's We're all the shit we have for this yeah. um i would love to check that one out so if anybody from scream is listening and wants to send us a blu-ray <laughs> so that i could watch all the bonus features i will gladly take it from you but uh i don't have any money so <laughs> you're gonna have to send it to me free <laughs> uh oh but yeah. anyway <laughs> describe the box art on i this. could afford this vhs and this is what it looks like <laughs> um we got nicholas cage front and center his name above the title and uh, it is a little bit of a play on the original poster. The original poster has the film strip going over his eye. This one just has what looks like uh, film cells of him like running in the rain along the side of him. So it's a little different from the actual theatrical poster. Uh, and it's very it has like the blue purple hue that was mm-hmm. prevalent in these movies in the late '90s. Tagline being, "You can't prepare for where the truth will take you." A film by Joel Schumacher, eight millimeter. And then one review at the bottom here, a nerve-shredding thriller from Michael Wilmington, our own, from Chicago Tribune. Yay! Hey, Michael. He doesn't listen. We're friends, though. We're not. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Flipping it over to the back here, we get more Nick Cage front and center yelling with his cage rage, uh, knowing knowing how to advertise this movie wonderfully. And then uh, the three stills we have here, it's like... Cage with Catherine Keener, Cage with Joaquin Phoenix, and then Cage in front of a fiery inferno. Cage, Uh, cage, cage! Yes, it's quite wonderful. We get a very short description here on the back. Academy Award winner Nicolas Cage, best actor, leaving Las Vegas, stars with Joaquin Phoenix and Catherine Keener in an electrifying thriller from the writer of Seven. That was big in their marketing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Directed by Joel Schumacher, The Client, Batman Forever, A Time to Kill. This dramatic story follows one man's obsessive search for the truth about a six-year-old crime and the ultimate discovery of the truth about himself. And then we get one review, devastating, thought-provoking, mind-blowing, from Lynn Blodes, APTV? I don't know what that is. Uh, Rated R. It's crazy the run Nicolas Cage went on in the 90s. Kiss of Death, Leaving Las Vegas... The Rock, Con Air, Face Off, City of Angels, Snake Eyes, I, Eight Millimeter, Bringing Out the Dead, Gone in Sixty Seconds, The Family Man. Oh, wow! I saw all of these movies. I think I did too. I've seen all of these. <laughs> Snake Eyes is one I love. Uh, Face Off is one I love. Leaving Las Vegas, he absolutely deserved the Oscar for. He's fucking wonderful in that movie. Gone in 60 Seconds, I really enjoy. It's just like a fun 
B movie. Like Bringing Out the Dead is an underrated Scorsese. I love that movie. I remember really liking that. Uh, and and then he kind of like just oh man he goes all over because I remember him in Matchstick Men and then of course then he hits his National Treasure days. Yeah, I mean National Treasure is obviously a blast and he does kind of some culty movies with Lord of War and Weatherman. I love Weatherman. I think that's a great movie. Uh, but then he falls apart. Then yeah. it then Wicker the, Man, the, Ghost oh, Rider, oh, World, World Trade Center. Uh, yeah, he does some stinkers. The even the second National Treasure, which I love the first one. I can't really say too many nice things about the second National Treasure. Well, then Treasure. he started. Doing I mean, stuff I've seen like, it a bunch of times. But. He started doing stuff like Bangkok Dangerous, and then yeah, it's just, it's just goes started nuts. saying yes to everything. Unfortunately, but I still think he is a great actor, and I love Nicolas Cage. And I think in Eight Millimeter, he does give a really good committed performance. Yeah. He he knows what he's doing with the character too. He turns him. He starts like you know with a suit and tie, straight lace, and then once he gets into this world, he just crumbles. He unravels, but not in a way that like they would have Nick Cage unravel today. You know, like if this movie came out today, they would have to have him go to like eleven or whatever. This one, he's really slowly unravels, and you just you know he has to have like that moment where he looks in the mirror and is just like you're okay you're okay <laughs> like it is a it's a slow unravel here yeah his i mean just to see him in the second half of this film i mean his physical transformation is is good to watch yeah in a way um so popping this tape in we don't have any trailers unfortunately but we do have the behind the scenes after so we'll talk about it after we talk about the movie um, three movies in a row i believe with no trailers woof how that happen what are we doing next week don't tell me let me think of it uh, it's your movie. I don't uh, that's not going to have any trailers either. Uh, <laughs> Damn it! So maybe one more week, and then we'll have trailers. Um, but uh, anywho, yeah, this one has no trailers. We get right into the movie here again. This is the first time I'm seeing this movie in its entirety. So <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yep. Um, first of all, before we even just get into the plot too much. I fucking loved this movie. <laughs> I loved it. It is it's disgusting and yeah, everything you're saying is right, but I think in this movie it's painting a world, it's painting a very ugly world, but it is painting a world that exists. Um and it uh it's full of fun performances and it's super pulpy, super pulpy and sweaty. Uh so I really enjoyed this movie just right off the bat gross yeah it's a it's a it is a grody grody movie but man it's a it's an entertaining watch and it's a it's a good detective noir story too it's got a lot of really good character actors from the 90s doing some really good performances yeah we we talked about before we started how great peter storm is in this movie best swedish actor i can think (laughs) of right now one of my favorite actors just period yeah he always comes with a different angle, so many different characters he's played, and they're all so good. Yeah, he's fucking amazing, and he's really not in this movie that much, but he is very memorable, mm-hmm. and he's essentially playing the devil in this movie, and or, it's wonderful. Or like porn Dracula. <laughs> yeah, either way, Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> I like porn Dracula. I think that's even better than my Satan comparison. <laughs> um, Every time I saw him, he, he, he had a cape on and then at the end he has a fucking crossbow. And I was like, that's Van Helsing. Yeah. And I'm like, he's porn Dracula. <laughs> yeah. And he's wonderful in this movie. Chewing scenery, uh, but in a very calculated way. Uh, yeah. See his true, literally scenery, chewing yeah, scenery. He yeah. puts the picture of his family <laughs> in his mouth of Nick Cage's family in his mouth and just chews it while he's saying his lines. So what we're saying is we're going to have a small fight when it comes to the museum. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, there's too much good stuff for me to put. Good. I'm good. I've got so much that I could pluck from from this movie that I really like. Yeah. Uh, but um, so basically, this movie starts off with a uh, very traditional way. We see him solve one case, you mm-hmm. know, figure out, and we r- realize he's sort of a upper tier PI. He's not like the you know the, the down and out alcoholic. Uh, was a former cop and now he's a PI. He's doing these investigations for like rich people. Yeah, it was like a secretary, or not a secretary, <laughs> Jesus. It was a senator. 
Yes, he's he's exposing uh, a senator's son's indiscretions. I think is what it was, or something like that. Somebody something. It's like a. It's not like a husband thing. It's like some other kind of relation or whatever. Um, but yeah, he is. He follows people around and gets the pictures and figures out, you know, missing things and what what people, what like people that can pay really well, you know, yeah, what what their little indiscretions are. Um, and so we see him solve a case. Everything's great. We meet his family. He's with Catherine Keener. Uh, they just had a baby, uh, named Cindy that he calls Cinderella, the whole movie, which is adorably Nick Cage. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you could tell just like sidebar here, you could tell this baby actor, whatever, whatever, wherever this baby came from, this baby loves Nicolas Cage. Like, this baby lights up when Nicolas Cage comes in the room, like, and is like hugging him. And like, it's usually these baby actors are just screaming and crying and they mm-hmm. like hate being there because there's a bunch of lights on them and a bunch of fucking and sweaty dudes hot. standing around yeah. them. Yeah. But like every time Nicolas Cage comes into frame, this baby lights up. I think that's just a testament to Nick Cage's character because babies know who good people are. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> I do love his character is hiding something from her. Uh, very small at the beginning of the film, and then it grows. And this one, he, he smokes. Yeah. And I just I like that because it, like, it immediately throws you into, he's very loyal to her, but he's also hiding a lot from her. He like has to keep his secrets, you know, like he won't tell her about the cases he's working on. Like even early with the Senator case, he doesn't say, you know what he was working on. And then, yeah, he keeps the smoking thing from her. Uh, He, he's like a man that's totally devoted to his wife, but he has to have his secrets. Yeah. And then of course it goes further down where he just, he uses, kind of like saving up money for his child for her college fund and like finding the big break as the reason why he becomes obsessed with these. I do really like it when at one point he says, you know, this could finally, when he starts his new case, which is what this whole movie is about. He says, you know, this could be our finally our big break and how his wife looks around at the house they have and all the good stuff. She's like, what do you mean? Finally, you know, like, (laughs) Yeah, it's it is. It's like he's saying he has to keep doing these things for money, but they're fine. He's obsessed. Yeah, he's obsessed with it, and he really gets into the world with this next case he gets, which is from just this rich uh, socialite person who this woman who uh, sends him to find the person on this film reel that her recently deceased husband had locked down. Mm-hmm. And uh, she gives him the film and says, figure out what's going on here. Is this real? Can you find this girl? Whatever. And he's like, okay, you know, like this is a job. I will take it. I will gladly take your money. Uh, and he goes in the other room and watches the film. And this is where it begins. This is where we get grody. This is where the movie gets grimy. Yeah, and it just shows a man with a mask on who's in a leather vest who murders a girl and then it, but really the whole scenes about obviously setting up the story, but the whole scenes about watching Nick cage, he's affected by it at this point in the film. Yeah. This is when he gets infected with the disease where he can't now he's in it. Like he has to see this through. Now he sees the film. He's very reactionary towards it. Uh, the a great little, reaction. Yeah. Some, I, maybe I wish they would have cut away a little bit because it was a little too much. But I, I get what they're selling. Yeah. They're, you know, it's obviously, it starts off like porn and then the woman is just brutally murdered by this masked man or whatever. Oh, and the actress in uh, who's playing the girl who gets it, she looks so uh, just depressed and weak and vulnerable. Like, yeah. it's just... It makes you really uncomfortable. Yeah, it's so like I think some of Cage's reactions are a little warranted because it's pretty grody. Yeah, and then um, and then but yeah, that is that is the infection. That is the mm-hmm. that is when it begins, and that's when he is going to take the case and he's going to find out if this is real and who this girl is. Yeah, and at this point he's feeling like, oh, you know, don't worry, these snuff films are always fake. Right. Um, 
So basically, it kind of starts off with find the girl and prove this is fake. Because the rich woman doesn't want to believe that her late husband, and they're mega rich, by the way. Yeah, like Uh, mansion, lawyer. Uh, I think they ran like a mining industry. Something something. like that. I don't know. Uh, And she wants to believe that he wouldn't just own a film like this and pay for it and watch it. Right. Um, so yes, yeah, she, and she wants, she wants to figure out what's going on. Great setup for a movie. I love yeah. this set. Like yeah. he's got to figure, he's got the film, he's got to figure out if it's real. Um, and then he's got to go into this world of snuff films. So I, I love the setup here. This is a great fun, skeezy you know, setup. What's the first place he goes to? Is it, does he go to California to try to find the missing, like a missing case? I think so. I think yeah. His first his first stop is California before he goes over to New York uh, to kind of wrap things up. So I think that's where he heads first. He's based in uh, Pittsburgh, um, yeah, or somewhere in Pennsylvania, but near Pittsburgh or whatever, because they mention Pittsburgh. Um, and then he goes out to California where he meets Max California, yeah. who is Joaquin Phoenix, giving I think maybe one of my favorite Joaquin Phoenix performances. He's very good in this. Very young, twenty five years old, and you could definitely see that he was someone who shined in front of the camera. Yeah, he was definitely going to be a star because Gladiator was right after this movie. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But he's quite good in it as the sort of his spirit guide into the world of snuff. Yeah. Uh, and what I think is happening here, I feel like Max California on paper is not that great, but Joaquin is bringing something to the performance because he's, you know, he's doing weird little things or he'll be, he'll say like, these are the three rules. You know, these are the three rules of this world. It's not real. If it is real, stay away. And I forgot the third rule. You know, like he does things like that. Yeah. Something, one of them was something about don't be every. There's always a, a victim. Don't be the victim. Yeah. I forgot that there's something like yeah, that. I yeah, I forgot. I forget the third one. But yeah, he's elevating this performance, I think, better than what it is on the page. No, that's why he won this. I, I imagine he didn't even have as big a role in this. And then once he got on camera, they're like, ooh, we're adding. Yeah, we got to add a bunch of scenes with him. Because <laughs> he's he, got the greatest line in the film is like, you know, when you see the devil, the devil doesn't change. The devil changes you. Yeah. Look, Pops, it's not too late to change your mind about all this. I'm going to tell you, there's things that you're going to see that, that you can't unsee. They get in your head and they stay there. How do you know what I've seen? Okay, fine. But everybody's got their limit. Look, I've been here six fucking years trying to get my music together. So I start clerking part-time where I work, you know, to make ends meet. And boom. Boom couple years go by and here i am i'm just saying before you know it you're in it deep in it don't worry about me but thank you oh you're welcome pops you dance with the devil the devil don't change the devil changes you some of your lyrics that's cute and it was used it's a trailer moment right yeah there. they use it in the trailer and all the marketing things and the behind the scenes thing they that's what this movie is about it is about mm-hmm. Nicolas Cage getting infected with the devil um, and being brought into this hell world. And But the beginning of it is Max California takes him to the world of these um, sex films because he works, he works in a sex shop where he's buying magazines. He tries to sell... Uh, uh Nicolas Cage a pocket pussy like it's oh yeah and he keeps trying to sell him on one um oh, so you got a lot of porn here uh would you like to buy an electric powered <laughs> pussy pocket I don't know whatever it was gross uh, yeah it's it's pretty hilarious um and like the entire time too in this scene uh Joaquin is wearing a shirt that's too small and his like gut is hanging out yes. it's wonderful it's well, such a so wonderful when choice. he turned yeah because I was looking at that I go ooh, that's that's not a good shirt for you <laughs> when he turns aside you're like you're not chubby it's just the way his body's shaped and the shirt it makes him look like he is and he has no chest yeah. by the way he, he like if he would have had a little beef in his chest it'd have been fine but no he's just like tummy hanging a little bit of tummy hanging out yeah <laughs> um but yeah so then he becomes the guide to this world of these sort of fringe porn filmmaking where yeah. he doesn't quite know the world of the snuff so much but he he doesn't think it's real either but he knows the stuff that's 
pretending to be like rape films and bondage. Right. And then he goes to this first place, which I think is, um, it's a whorehouse, right? Whatever you call it. Prostitution. Cause it's got the girls on the couch looking at Nick Cage. Like he's a piece of meat. Yeah. And there's rooms where sucking is happening. Like <laughs> something. I don't know. It's, it was gross. What do we call them now? Are they cat houses? Uh, yeah, I think that's what they call them. I don't know. I mean, in this movie, they're horror houses because this is gross. Yeah, it's it's. But maybe in a better world, it's a cat house. In in a clean world, yeah. yeah. But this is like where like you get syphilis from walking in the room. <laughs> it's so uh, gross. And then the guy gets really pissed because Nick Cage is looking at all these films. He's like. Do you have anything called like a snuff film? I mean, he just starts yelling at him and threatens him with a gun. And then somehow they get downstairs into just a fucking dungeon of gross porn. Yes. Yes. And they even take a look at some films and they look like snuff films. Turns out they're not. Yeah, from they're the like, Philippines. Yeah, they're like, thank God, because uh, there's repeat actors in them, but they are made to look like snuff films. And they're but, gross. They're yes, gross. but this isn't going to help Nick Cage with his case. No. They're like, okay, thank God that these that exist aren't real, but... Do you, why, every time he mentions snuff film, the characters overreact with anger. You had the the guy with the gun. I don't know if he was supposed to be you know, from South America or... You know, if he was from Mexico, I don't know who, whatever, but he goes crazy about it. And then the guy downstairs, he's like, I got the, the most real stuff you could ever find. And he's like, how about, how about some snuff films? And he's like, get out of here. I feel like it's because like these fringe sex sort of, uh, you know, dungeons and cat houses and video stores and things like that. They're like snuff is what would like give us a bad name you know like they're like <laughs> they're like well we have the fringe sex stuff but like it's still just sex stuff like it's all come on, man don't fucking ruin it by like killing somebody in it and, yeah. and max california i think mentions it a lot of times he's like this is all technically legal yeah yeah and then he goes to i don't know the big tall guy who's just like no man this is the most real stuff you can get and then that's the fake philippine stuff right and they, they've sort of vet through that. Um, I kind of wanted that big, tall, weird actor that sold them these to come back. Yeah, they, they like... There's something about him. In the world we kind of go into with Max California, we meet a lot of really interesting and cool and weird, like, late 90s, like, uh, that sort of uh, cyberpunk look kind of thing with mixed yeah. with this, like... S and M sex world, like it's very 1999. It's very Y2K looking in there. Ooh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, where it's a mix of goth, cyberpunk, yeah. and S and M. Yeah, it's just it's weird. It's it's kind of cool to look at. Yeah. Um, uh, I thought this movie would have a lot more dong in it. Yeah, this one it has it has a lot of sex stuff. Yeah. Like we do see, like I mentioned, like the simulated blowjobs. We mm -hmm. we see. Uh, uh, the filming of one, one porn film with when James Gandolfini's character gets introduced, oh, yeah. um, which has some female nudity in it, but uh, it's yeah, no peen, no peen. To be I think seen. there was one peen. I think there was that scene, but it was it was quick. Yeah, it was uh, even the female nudity is very quick in that scene too. It's not, yeah, it doesn't it's, linger on it. I and it, I, I think they're doing that on purpose because uh, even a lot of the nudity they show, it's kind of like reflective on like say a screen that um they'll like shoot through the screen and then show um oh what am i trying to say so like a lot of times when he was watching the eight millimeter film it would be shining through onto like i don't know like a curtain or something and he's watching it but you're watching all the nudity while watching um nicholas cage look at it it's yeah. a weird yeah they had some it, interesting shots in this yeah it's not like you're just forced to stare at it you're like watching him watch it so you're seeing it because it's playing through the yeah. screen or whatever but you're not seeing it main focus yeah i'm having a really hard time describing some of the shots because they're very creative and interesting yeah i think i think like what joel schumacher brings to the andrew kevin walker script that like you know it's different it's totally different from fincher fincher does his music video thing and like uh, schumacher is more theatrical you kind of almost get this very yeah. like, grandiose view of this hellscape. Oh, world. <laughs> I, I think that's a perfect word for Joel Schumacher. Grandiose. Yeah, that's his thing. He, yeah. That's that's what he does. Well, um, well Fincher's visuals are well, just like 
get buried in your mind. They're amazing. I, I love Fincher's like just crazy shit he does. Yeah, I mean, I I liked. I was more of a fan of Fincher around this time, you know, when he was doing Seven and Fight Club and stuff like that. I as, I'm not as much of a fan of him now. I feel like he's kind of. Did doing... he do History of Violence? No, Cronenberg. Cronenberg did that. Okay. Um, <laughs> different guy. <laughs> um, but D- uh, different crazy dude. Yeah, different. Uh, very specific artist. Um, yeah, Fincher's almost kind of doing an impression of himself these days. I feel like so. Well, what's uh, a couple of last films he's done? I can't remember. Social Network, Gone Girl, uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Oh, remake. I I did really like Gone Girl. I like Gone or, Girl. Or am I it's... thinking of Gone Baby Gone? What? Wait, which one? Which one's the Ben Affleck one? Well, he's in both of those. Oh, Jesus Christ, really? <laughs> <laughs> no way, like... he's not in Gone Baby Gone. He directed Gone Baby Gone. That's Casey it. Affleck is in that. Yeah, I liked Gone Baby Gone. I, think. I like Gone Girl a lot, but I think it's the script that makes that movie good. Oh, God, I'm so confused, these movies. <laughs> Stop using Gone and Baby in your fucking titles. <laughs> um, but anywho, I digress. <laughs> Back to the movie. Um, yeah, Nick Cage is... Going further into the world, and we this is when we start to meet the characters like the James Gandolfini, and the we find out who the girl is, and we meet uh, his, her mother. Uh, we, this is when we meet Peter Stormare in this section of the movie. She's here. such a fantastic actress. Um, yeah, what's what's her name? You got this pulled up here. Uh, the it's Janet. Amy. It's Amy Morton. All right, is the um, yeah she plays actress. Janet Matthews in the movie. So we find out that Mary Ann Matthews is the daughter that gets. She's so lonely and so sad. Yeah, she's so sad, and she just wants company from Nick Cage when he comes to investigate. I know. I, all I, I just I want to go over to her house and just like you know watch a movie with her. And, yeah, like just yeah. not so much say sorry that what happened. I'm just like. I, you're so lonely. Yeah, she and she plays it so devastatingly well. Oh, I know. It's like, there's a lot of things from this movie that will transfer over when I remember it in the future, and it's her performance is one of it because it just makes me feel awful in in every in the way you're supposed to. Yeah, yeah. yeah everything with her works. In this yeah, movie. it's uh, it's so sad. I just want to hug her. Yeah, it's she plays it so well. Uh, she's not just like the crying mother, you know, like she's not just like, Oh, I'm sad. My daughter, no, but gone. she's, she's moldy inside. Cause she's just crying. Inside. Right. Right. It's she, she's great in this. And we find out that James Gandolfini is the porn director that possibly probably shot the movie, uh, or was involved in it. And we go to his gross office where he has a line. of No, no, women. no. What's his name? Shot it. James Gandolfini might be the guy in the background. Right. Right, right, right. He's the, but he's like the porn producer guy. He's the one with the the cast. The connections. Couch. Yeah, he's the oh, he's, he's the Harvey Weinstein in the movie. He's actually so... he's playing Harvey Weinstein in this movie. <laughs> like, if you think about it, he's so gross. <laughs> uh, a great James Gandolfini yeah. performance yeah. because I feel like around this time he was only getting cast as Tony Soprano and every other thing besides the Soprano. He was always. Uh, I've actually heard him talk about this. He got so tired of getting these roles or getting offered these roles where he was playing a gross human being um but this one this one's like pinnacle like this yeah. is a really good james gandolfini performance it's different yeah uh it's in a, yeah he's playing he's playing a porn Ooh. casting couch gross harvey weinstein guy here he i i remember in the same interview he talked about like, i like playing the bad guy i'm just tired of playing gross people and uh, he's probably talking about this role. <laughs> but he's so good in it. Like, yeah. he's so good. No, he's perfect. Um, and uh, You believe him the minute you see him on screen. Yeah, absolutely. You're, and, you, of course, he's sweating. The yes. First, yeah. yeah. Um, but he's got, like, that just, like, gross, like, Hawaiian shirt on. Like, just, like, a dark Hawaiian shirt that, like, he probably has never, that character has never washed, you know? Like, that kind of guy. You can smell him when you go into the office. Like, his office probably smells like P and B.O., you know? (laughs) Oh, and even his first words when, um, he, uh... Nicholas Cage comes in and goes, have you seen this girl? And he looks at her and he goes, do you know how much pussy comes through that door? And I was like, yuck. Yeah, he's so gross in this. Um, but we find now that we know who the, the girl is and we find this you know, mystery man from the video, we then that leads us down the road to the guy who actually shoots it, who is Peter Stormare. I can arrange something really special for the town. You can do that. Good enough for me. I'll 
just have to put my thinking cap on. I'm going to keep this as a deposit. You make sure you call me after 10 o'clock tonight. 10 o'clock. You know, you have a very special, very beautiful face, the way light hits it. I'd like to shoot you. You don't mind, do you? The camera shot. You trust me to take your money, but not your picture. Those are two different kinds of trust. I hope we can do business. And uh, he's beautiful. <laughs> he's so good in this movie. And it leads... It leads to what I think is uh, one of the movie's best strengths, too. It leads to a climax here where Peter Stormare is going to set up a shoot for Nicolas Cage using the guy, the machine, who is the one in the video who kills the girl. Yeah. And they're, so now Nick Cage has his in to get the machine. And they all kind of get in a room together and, you know... He tells Max California, go home. Like, this is it. I'm going to find the guy, and we're going to take care of it. So he tells him to go home. Well, they get to the shoot, and of course, Peter Stormare has not booked any of the girls that Nicolas Cage has requested for this fake shoot. He is there basically trapping Nick Cage, and they've got uh, Max California tied up in the back of the car as well. Yeah, and the whole reason they figure out that he's a P.I., is because the gross ass lawyer from the beginning of the film comes back and he's, you know, like a business partner with them when they put together the original eight millimeter film. Right. He he is the weasel guy from Silence of the Lambs that we mentioned earlier. He just plays this character in every movie he is in. <laughs> and he, he does it really well. And I, I knew he was, I, I mean, obviously we kind of knew this was going to be the, uh oh, he's in serious trouble moment of the movie. But when. He uh, he's in their office and he's discussing the film and he goes, you trust you pay me enough. You trust me enough to make your film, but not enough to take your picture. And he's just like, that's two different types of trust. And I was yeah. like, oh, this is when it's going to happen. <laughs> trailer moment. Yeah. And that is in the trailer. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, now everybody's in the room. James Gandolfini is there. Um, it, the lawyer's there. Peter Stormare. Joaquin. Nick Cage. This seems like the end of the movie, but it's yeah, not. But I looked. But it's not the when end I was of the watching. Movie. I go, well, there's like half an hour left. What's gonna? That's happen? That's when I texted you saying I got a half hour left of this to watch because <laughs> I thought it was the end and I was gonna get ready to go. Uh, but uh, yeah, so this happens, and uh, basically Nick Cage uh, reveals to the other guys that the lawyer is getting paid more. They don't a like a million that. dollars. A million dollars. They don't like that. Which leads the lawyer to pull a gun on Peter Stormare, shoots him in the neck, and kills him in one of the best death scenes I've seen. Where he's like, "It's not cinematic enough." <laughs> yeah, because he doesn't. He, sh he shoots him with the he shoots the lawyer with a crossbow, and then he gets shot in the neck, and then he's like sitting there dying in the machine's lap, and he's just like, "No, not, not like, like this." <laughs> <laughs> just in a beautiful Peter Stormare way. It's great. I love this death scene. He's so fucking good. Um, but then that leaves the machine and uh, Nick Cage because uh, as they get the film, because that's what they're mainly after, they just want to get mm -hmm. the film away from Nick Cage, they kill Max California as well. So no more Joaquin, which is sad because he's so fucking good in this movie too. Yeah, they just slit his throat. And that is it. And that's he's gone. But uh, they Oh, and they have him up like Jesus. Yeah, they have him like Because of cross, course. Because of course they do. Um, so now it's just the machine... James Gandolfini and Nick Cage left. That's it. And I'm like, ooh, where's this going to go? Yeah, he calls his wife because his wife is basically just there to be on the other end of the telephone. Uh, and Constantly wondering yeah. where he's at and because he's traveling between New York and L.A. now at this point trying to track this. Uh, what's the actress's down. name? Um, Catherine Keener. Yeah, Catherine Keener, which, you know, the next year was in Capote. And she's amazing in that. I mean, that whole movie is just people... <laughs> basically changing their career with their performances. Acting, <laughs> acting their asses off. Uh, and I don't think Capote's for everyone, but just like if you watched it, you're like, oh, I think there's a lot of acting class in this film. Uh, Catherine Keener is always reliably good, though. Yes, yeah. You cast her in your movie, she's going to 
bring it. She's too talented for this role, though. But she has nothing to do in this yes. movie. She's on the other end of the phone, trying to get a hold of him constantly. And like what we're using her for is the pull between the hell that he has been infected with and, and can't escape and the, the home that he's built with her and the pull that he yeah. has where he wants to go back there, but he can't leave this world behind yet. Yeah, she, I mean, he calls her after he escapes, and he's just like, get out of the house. Then he goes to the rich woman, tells her, or calls the rich woman, is like, it's all true. Yeah, they did it. It's real. And then the next morning, when he leaves his wife again, and she's like, we might not be here when you come back. But he, he like, hands her a wad of cash. Yeah, that the old woman, who also has killed herself now, yeah, yeah. Uh, has left him. And it really shocks Nicolas Cage that she did this. Yeah. Yeah, because he just calls her and says, it's real, it happened, your husband did this. And she just goes and kills herself that night. Yeah, and like sends sends the, the little girl's mom, who was in the film, uh, a load of cash. Yeah, as well as Nick Cage. And then gives Nick Cage just like an entire, it looks like a drug deal, like yeah. worth of cash. Yes, just in a manila envelope. So I'm assuming that's probably the cash they found in the safe originally. Probably, yeah, because they said they found cash. And the film in there in yeah. stocks. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, but that's that's what he was hiding. And then there, you know, just to backtrack before we get to the real finale here, um, the uh, the reason I love the reason that the lawyer before the lawyer dies gives why the guy had this why this guy had this film made or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, why not? He's rich because he could because he could. He's rich. And that's what got him off. Like, why not? Yeah, it's fucked up, but it's very real. Yeah, it like it brings some emotional weight and then makes sense for the ending that we're going to get. Um, Which so, is Nick Cage going off the deep end. Yeah, this is where you get your cage rage finally and you get some uh, you get some great cage yelling moments here. Mm -hmm. uh, he pretty, he starts to snap in like that climactic other scene but now mm -hmm. we've gone full cage rage as he goes back to kill james gandolfini he goes he literally flies back from his home back to la just to kill james gandolfini and, and he can't do it at first nope because he's he's not part of this world he's you know he's seeing it but he's not a part of this world so in one of the most fucked up scenes in this movie he has to call the mom tell her that the daughter's dead I have the guy who did it. Tell me how much you loved your daughter so that I can go kill him. And she's literally crying on the phone being like, I loved her. I loved her. All so that Nick Cage can get like the, the, the juice to go in there and kill him. Man, and he does. Bashes him over the head with the butt of his gun. Doesn't even shoot him. No, but like <laughs> repeatedly. Like yeah. you hear it like a lot of times. <laughs> yeah, he, he smashed his probably his nose into his face and all of his teeth out. I mean, just we're guessing. And then he fucking burns him alive. Just like they burnt the eight millimeter film. Yeah. About 20 minutes beforehand. Yep. And he, he burns him up with the other stacks of porn. He yeah. also has yeah. in his car, uh, James Gandolfini. Yeah. That was funny when James Gandolfini was trying to make his run for the hills, I he guess. He took a bunch of his porn He's with like him. <laughs> stuffing porn in his trunk. <laughs> Just what a scumbag. Uh, it's great. And then this leads to the finale. He makes some calls to the police departments, and uh, he's really good at giving fake names. He gives fake names to everybody. He's like, he's Tom Anderson, he's Tom Hart, but his real name is Tom Webb. So he uses his real first name, but he uses these fake last names, uh, and he's really good at it. Uh, and he calls these police departments to try to find a guy who got stabbed. And that is the machine who got stabbed in the, the scene uh, where everybody died. Um, and finds him, tracks him down, gets the guy's mm -hmm. name, and finds his house where he's living with his grandmother. Because, of course, you know, he's this s and masked, big, sweaty, yeah. vest-wearing dude. But he lives his... with his grandma. And <laughs> she was going to church. Yes, she was on her way to church. That's so weird. She was being bussed to church, and when she leaves, Nick Cage jumps into the house, has this big climactic fight with the mask man, mm -hmm. but all the while just wants him to take the mask off. You know, like, who are you? Who who are you underneath the mask or whatever? And in the sort of final battle, in the rain, in their yard, like mud everywhere, whatever, 
Uh, oh, like Lethal Weapon 2? Yeah, like Lethal Weapon 2. Um, he takes the mask off, and it's just like a regular looking dude with glasses. Kind of a nerdy looking... Or was looking... that Lethal Weapon, the first one with Gary Busey? Did they fight in the rain? I don't remember. Who cares? <laughs> we'll get there when we eventually yeah. talk about the Lethal Weapon sequels, because I'm sure we will. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> because we inevitably will talk about those. Um, but yeah, he's like a regular nerdy-ass dude with glasses. And again, what's the reason? And it's like, I, I wasn't raped. I wasn't beat. My family loved me. This is just who I am. And that's the scariest yeah. reasoning you can yeah, give. Yeah, doesn't he say, I only did it because I liked it and I was good at it? Yeah. Yuck. Yeah, just like this nerdy, schlubby dude. Just like, fine life. Everything is fine, but was just fucked up. And that's why he killed these girls. Yeah, and they never really tell you how many times they had done this. Yeah, which is even sicker. You know, like yeah. the fact that this probably is not the only time this has happened. Yeah, and one of the things is like, because they kept saying, or at least like, kind of wanting to let you think this, where it's just like, you know, these girls come and go, no one gives a shit what happens to them. Yeah. That is another thing that just like, oh, it's, oh, upsetting. it's, it's too real. Yeah. It's gross. And then we, we, after that big finale, after he kills the machine, Nick Cage gets a letter from the mother saying, thank you for. Being mm -hmm. the only person besides me to actually care about her, and uh, we get the last image of him, of the wife looking at him through the window, and Nicolas Cage just giving the most like broken smile as the credits roll. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that was that's. Oh man, that is a bittersweet ending. Yes, like that, yeah, the bad guys are dead, but he's fucking broke. Yeah, there's no fixing what's happened to him, and the fact that like this is probably still happening, and they can't change it. You know, yeah. well, these the, guys are gone, but that doesn't mean it's over. The devil is in him forever now. Yep, and that's that's eight millimeter. <laughs> it's a happy movie. It's, it's a blast. If you'd uh... <laughs> no, it's a it's a super skeezy, super gross movie. But very effective, I think, and uh, very well done for what it is. I really like this one. I was engaged. I have to say that. Uh, it, I mean, there's a couple times I was like, wow, is this only one hour in? Oh, wow, we have 30 minutes left. So I don't know if the pacing was perfect, but I was engaged. Yeah, I never, I never looked away. Let's head off to the museum. This is the second time I've had to reclaim my property from you. That belongs in a museum. So do you. Yes, every week we take something from the movie that we either really liked or really want to learn from to put in our museum to look at for all time. What are you adding to our museum this time? Okay, I'm going to let you have film Dracula, I think. <laughs> porn, porn Dracula. Porn Dracula. But uh, I will actually... I'm going to put in the courage that this film had. I really had never seen someone get away with something like this at this time period. Yeah, this is this is pretty aggressive for 99. Yeah. I don't really like the uh, content that's on film, but honestly, I'm impressed that they had the courage to put that content on film. Yeah, uh, same. I think that's another reason why I like the movie. Not so much that I like the content, but yeah. the fact that they did it, they went for it. And I think this was honestly the first film I'd ever seen go after this crap. Yeah, to go after snuff films. This is definitely one of the biggest. Like, this was a wide release movie. This was a big movie for uh, uh, Columbia Pictures. Forty million dollar budget made ninety six worldwide. And Spawned other than the sequel, <laughs> apparently, yeah, I saw that there was a sequel. Didn't look into it much, but uh, you know, made the most amount of money in the U.S. and Germany. So take that for what it's worth. Yeah, right. Germany is like a movie about snuff films. This is right up our alley. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, someone had to say it. I did. I did. I said it. <laughs> oh, Germans. Yeah, I, I got German in me, so I guess it's like okay for me to say right because I have it. Right? I'm German too. Yeah. I, so I we get know. we get we get to say these things like it's yeah. allowed. <laughs> we earned it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah. I you know I do. I think. I could put a ton of things in this that I like, uh, mostly performances. Yeah. Um, but I think I will put uh, Porn Dracula in there, Peter Stormare, because he's so good. In a movie of good performances, he still stands out. 
He sure does. Even in a movie with like the great performance by Joaquin Phoenix, Peter Stormare still stands out. You know what I mean? So like he he's uh he's quite good in it. He's he chews scenery literally in the movie and uh but it's just the right amount and he's not in it for that long. He's in it for maybe twenty five minutes of this two hour movie. Uh, and he steals every scene he's in. So yeah, he fully commits to a very small, uh, a very small role. But man, is it memorable! Yes, wow. he's he's so good. But when he chews up his family's photo. Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Literally chewing the scenery, and then sticks it to like uh, what? So they had poles, giant poles in this. I don't know what this was. Factory a warehouse where warehouse. they shoot their porn. Yeah. I don't know, and it's like covered in just plastic. And he just licks the back of the photo and slaps it on a pole. Yeah. It's just so messed up. Just so gross. So gross. Yeah. Great performance. <laughs> oh, man. I Yeah, I still, I can't believe this movie exists. I really can't. I'm surprised that one, I'm surprised that, I know Joel Schumacher was super popular uh, and everything like that, but I'm surprised that he got people to back this in Columbia and then to allow him to use all of this script, which I assume was all in there. And then fucking shoot it. Yeah. And put it in the theaters. Like, this came out in a wide release. I remember seeing the trailer before a bunch of movies in 99 and being like, whoa, that looks that looks dirty. <laughs> and it more than doubled its money, so. Yeah. I've seen, now, I have seen the sequel before. Uh, I saw that one first because it was just on TV randomly. So I had never seen this one, but I have seen the sequel. And it is, that one isn't as gross as this. But it is kind of like just the schlocky direct-to-video sequel of it. It's it's kind of fun to watch. Yeah. Like it's bad, but it's kind of fun to watch. Does it have anyone in it you remember? Uh, it's the girl is recognizable. She's like a direct-to-video movie actress. Okay. I think she's the girl in um, the In Crowd. I think that's what I've seen her in before. The oh the the British no the the blonde girl in the In Crowd. Oh okay all right yeah but uh, yeah it's. It, the sequel's fun trash, I guess. Okay, fun trash. But this one's something special. This one's something unique here, I think. Yeah, you can watch it. I'm just letting you know. It's gross. Yeah, trigger warnings. Like, uh, maybe, uh, I, guess, I would say, like, don't save this one for a Sunday afternoon. But I literally did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any good day to watch this. But if you're ever curious enough about it, I think it's a solid noir Neo noir movie. Okay. So, yeah, I recommend it. Check it out uh, yeah. if you like this kind of shit. And probably in our next episode, we'll be able to talk about the Oscars. Yeah, because uh, Oscars are airing today when we're recording, uh, but this will drop after the Oscars, so unfortunately we can't talk about them. But we'll yeah. we'll talk about it next next episode a little bit. Yeah, when we go on to week two of Noir March. What is Noirch. It? Noirch. Noirch. <laughs> Noirch. Sounds like something that, uh, oh, what is that character from Thundercats? Oh, just like it makes a sound? Yeah. Noarch. Noarch. Yeah. yeah. Noarch. Uh, I really wanted to do I've been planning Noarch since, I think, October. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You were excited about it. So you, you've got some interesting picks. Yeah, some interesting titles to talk about. Next week is going to be very different. Very different from yeah. uh, a different time period. Uh, another renowned filmmaker involved in it. Um, a couple of renowned filmmakers involved in the next one. Um, and hopefully the next one, we won't have 25 to 30 mile an hour gust of winds in the background. Yeah. Right. What a weird day it is today. It's crazy out there. Yeah. If you, uh, if you're listening to this on the Thursday, uh, that this drops the uh, Sunday of Oscars, if you were in Chicago, what's up with that wind guys, what's going on? <laughs> it's freaking crazy. Anyway, anyway, that will end eight millimeter. This lovely little film, yes, that isn't so little, uh, but I believe a lot of people have not seen this, so it should be interesting when it drops. And uh, come back next week. Remember, you can rate and review us on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube, all that stuff. Subscribe, email us at analogjonestof at gmail dot com, and Matt may respond to you. Maybe. May actually, I'm more likely now to respond on the Facebook because there's been getting there's been a little peak in activity on the Facebook these days. So a little bit, a little, a little bit. bit. So come right in and 
have some discussions with us about stuffs. And maybe next week or the week after, we'll have more information about your Windy, Windy City Horrorama Film Festival. Yeah, as you're listening to this, if you're listening to this the Thursday it drops, you have one more day to submit your films. And you have one more day to buy tickets while they are still $80. Um, well, that's like complete fast pass yes. for 80 Yeah. Yes, complete fast pass for $80. It gets you into everything. <laughs> we're going to have around 15 films, and we're going to have a bunch of parties, and we're going to have Q&As and uh, everything. So the $80 gets you into this whole weekend-long event. Um, it's a great deal. It's a steal. You're stealing from us. But we want you to be there, so we want you to steal from us. <laughs> so you have one more day to buy that uh, if you're listening to this when this drops. Uh, if you missed it, though, uh, tickets are $90, which is still a hell of a deal because it's less than half price still <laughs> of what we should be charging. Uh, so you're still getting a deal if you missed it, the $80, and it's up to $90. Um, and then also, yeah, if, it's, if you're catching this on the last day, please submit. We still can take a look at uh, some some movies. We're locking in the program, but we've still got some room. So send us your stuff. And uh, if you're, again, listening to this after, thank you for those who have sent in, who have submitted. And uh, we're looking forward to dropping the schedule on the 30th of March. So look out for that. Um, keep an eye on our website, uh, WittyCityHorrorama.com. And um, definitely keep in touch with me about that, too. If you're interested, I'll talk your ear off about the festival. Awesome. Thanks for listening, and remember to be kind. Rewind. Hey, Toxic here. And Meridon, too. We're the hosts of the Overleague podcast. Are you a fan of Overwatch League, or just a fan of Overwatch in general? Well, if you are, we break down matches and all other Overwatch happenings, and we won't judge your main. Tune in every other Tuesday to the Overleague on Geekscape, wherever you get your podcasts.